Welcome back. I'm Taryn, what a color artist. And I'm Siglinda. Welcome again to another episode of Art Sparks with Taryn and Siglinda. And Taryn, who's with us again today? Well, we're so happy to have once again welcome George Rivera into Art Sparks. Okay, so artists use a lot of hats, okay? But he wears a lot of hats more than I think than most of us, okay? And he does successfully, really successfully, okay? So in our previous episode, we talked about um, George as an artist and as an instructor, all right? So today we'd like to learn more about George, the art curator, the juror, the juror, and the museum director, all right? So first, okay, we did an episode about the art world to explain people because actually we don't know what are these people and what their roles. But it's so nice to hear you, the one who has been using it, explain about what is the roles of a curator, the juror, the museum director. So they can really get an idea of what are they about? What is it about your different jobs? Well, thank you. Thank you both. It's, it's a real pleasure to be back on Art Sparks um, and, and sharing um, and as we were talking about, maybe demystifying some of these terms and the roles so that you know people feel more comfortable and, and, and I hope they will. Um, you know, if you look at it from a business perspective of a large corporate business, you know, middle size and then a mom and pop, you know, kind of shop business, um, you know, the roles of museum directors uh, and curators and, and the different members of the team can vary. And each one has a very specific role. Think, Try to think of the, the uh, well, the shop owner uh, as the CEO. Um, and all the museums, uh, and, and I'm talking primarily about the nonprofit organizations, which are most of the museums, are the nonprofit private uh, museums, and they will have a board of directors, you know, who oversee uh, everything at the museum to make sure that the museum is properly being run you know, ethically, uh, and morally, and financially, um, you know, you, you're, it's, it's very similar. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, aren't aware of, you know, what a museum director does. And sometimes they'll wear multiple hats. The director is a CEO. And, you know, depending on the size of the museum, if it's middle size and smaller, the director may also wear a hat of the CEO and the visual uh, kind of director of the organization and kind of two for one. So, you know, the background of an individual who wants to be a director, you know, when people ask me, what should I pursue education-wise? Um, having the artistic vision, the art, the art historical perspective, that's that's very important in a fine art museum. Uh, in other kind of museums, you, you have other areas of expertise and scholarship and, and academic uh, uh, I, would, I would say experiences that are going to be very important. But for a, a fine art museum, one thing that I, I think surprises people is that you have to have a very strong understanding of business. Because if you don't run the business properly, there's not going to be any art or education programs or community outreach that are going to exist longer than that one year launch program. You know, how do you sustain financially? When you are a nonprofit, you aren't selling actually products. And you know, people may think, well, what about museum gift stores and shops like that? Well, these are auxiliary programs where the funding goes back into general operating, but it, it is a very different business being a nonprofit. So for an executive director, there's um, of course, you know, the title of CEO, executive director or president and they respond directly to the board of trustees and uh, then the director hires the different team members uh, generally a curator of art curator of education uh, maybe curator of digital interactive kind of um, you know, newer technologies um, you know, areas of specialty and then of course you need the, the team itself that, that runs the museum from public relations, PR, marketing, grant writing, development director, uh, which is one of the most difficult positions. I mean, it, it, 
if you're looking for uh, you know, a position uh, around the country, uh, you know, development director positions are popping up all the time because they are literally, their head is in the chopping block. You know, I, I don't want to be painting a, such a dark, gruesome picture, but the stress level on a development director and a development team is not just to get funding for one year, but continuously year after year with inflationary cost increases, everybody wanting their salaries to, to come up a little higher. And the stronger your museum, the more visual presence, people are wondering, you know, these, these great shows locally are wonderful, but when are we gonna start getting some of those big shows? You know, like, so will we ever get some name artists? Well, the cost of hosting, of even competing, to be considered a host for one of these major traveling blockbusters is phenomenal. The insurance aspect of it, 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 it will blow most people's minds. Is your facility capable of housing and, and, and presenting uh, a, a blockbuster show? Do you have 24 seven security at, at the highest level? Um, you know, all of these components come into play. So. When you, when you build a team, you, you need a, a bunch of highly educated, experienced, specialized talent that understands you know, the most current issues and challenges. And you know, here we are in California. Um, whenever we were touring a show from our museum or we were hosting a show, we had to factor in the fact that you know, our state is considered a risk for earthquakes. And, you know, so when, when you look at an overall map of the United States, there are certain zones that are hurricane, tornado, flooding, snow, uh, and California is the one for earthquakes. And, you know, sometimes uh, a lender or a museum is not going to feel comfortable. It doesn't matter whether or not you can insure or not. We're talking about works that may be at risk. So, you know, as a director, um, in my shoes, I tried to surround myself with ex extremely extraordinary experienced individuals that were very up to date on, on all of this type of information uh, so that um, we would develop a strong reputation over time and, and not just be kind of open for a few years, big, you know, big fireworks and all of a sudden what happened? Um, they had to close their doors. Thank you so much for sharing that, George, because in our episode on the art world, we likened the art world that is such an ivory tower, heavy concept to it's just the visual arts industry, right? You have the high tech industry, you have the oil industry, you have the visual arts industry. And what you just described really proves that it is just an industry and a business like anything else. And they have concerns and they have costs. and we're not even talking about the art inside the museum yet, right? And without artists, you don't have a product to wreck your business brain over to have you, to run your museum. So, so um, the way we understand is that it's the art curator and the art juror that des that decide which artists and which artworks go into the exhibitions. Correct? Can you talk a little bit more about that on how that is chosen? You mentioned the sure. cost of big names, but it doesn't. Yeah, just to tell us a little bit more, what, what do you think is important there? Yeah, and and I, I've seen a lot of different model prototypes uh, and, and approaches, but usually you will find if you go to a website and, and you, you look at a museum, again, the, the, the structure is so similar to any type of successful corporate entity. Uh, you have your, your mission, you have your goals and objectives for the organization. Um, and then you, you bring in people that will help emphasize and successfully carry that out. So if, uh, say, let's say like at the Trite Museum where I was at uh, for 28 years, our emphasis primarily was the greater Bay Area of Northern California. Now we could extend it down to Southern California, but, but pretty much that was our territory. So we, we weren't looking at, you know, uh, artists from other regions of the United States. That, that it wasn't our area of emphasis or strength. So it's very important to have a, a very clear and a, a uh, kind of uh, 
a consistent uh, mission statement uh, as far as what the museum exists for. You know, what is their purpose? And um, you know, what are they known for? And then how each institution goes about uh, addressing that it is, is, is unique and interesting. You will see uh, where in some cases, the executive director will take the lead on that and has a certain vision, conveys that to the curators uh, who then either amongst themselves, curatorial team at on staff, or they may also have members uh, of a curatorial committee, which can include maybe some community members, artists in the community, perhaps a professor or two from the local uh, universities uh, in the arts. Uh, it could include, it usually does, a board member or two. And so that as a committee, they review all the different proposals that are submitted. And it, it's a way of of, in, of getting people to bit, at least on the team and in the community, to, to get a, a better understanding how it all works. And it's not just the executive director only showing her or his best friends uh, or, or opportunities to uh, kind of get a better job someplace or the curator. It, it's a way of getting input from everybody uh, to keep it fresh. And you know, I, I think if you're sitting on the board of trustees and you're a volunteer in a community and you're giving so much of your time and effort trying to promote the museum and raise money. You're making phone calls to your friends all the time to, to come to our black and white soirees and fundraisers, our auctions. Um, it, it gives them another connection that's important to the museum other than just trying to raise money all the time. Um, it, so you will see some museums that will have um, you know, a committee and they may meet quarterly or once a year or twice a year. And uh, usually the curator will present perhaps a selection of possibilities. Uh, th there's no way the curator is going to bring in, you know, every couple of months, you know, 500 to 1,000 proposals for this committee. It's, it's amazing when you become a curator, uh, suddenly your, your friend list just grows mathematically. It just, <laughs> Everybody, you know, now you're their friend, you know, and wherever you go, you could be at Whole Foods ordering lunch and somebody go, oh, uh, George, you're the curator, yes. Uh, uh, you may not know me, but, uh, you know, I have some slides here. Can you take a look at these? And, and I thought, well, um, yeah, um, sure, <laughs> I'll take two. <laughs> uh, it's, it comes with the territory. So that would be a good question I would have. So you, because some curators and directors they're not artists but you are so it's been been it's been be easier for you being an artist or is it not it helps it I, helps I, I, from my personal experience and opinion it helps because even when you're an artist and you tell an artist no they think you're crazy uh they think it's political they think you don't like them they there's just so many reasons, and I understand that as an artist, it can't be about the work. It must be something about me. You don't like my hair. That's what it is. You know, it, it, it's got to be something. Um, but I, I think as an artist, you know, uh, it, it was always an asset because you know, for an, I think especially an established artist, they're looking at a young curator, and they know, okay, uh, George. I know you would like to show my work at your museum. I'm actually kind of holding out until the Crocker or the SF MoMA or Oakland Museum uh, approaches me. Because if I say yes to you, you're a part of a smaller museum, they're not gonna touch me for five years probably. And uh, so before I say yes to you, I appreciate your enthusiasm. I'm I'm in negotiations with a bigger museum that's going to produce a major catalog and it's going to tour my show. And because it's a bigger museum, I'm likely to get bigger press and possibly a contact to maybe one of the major international biennales. But if I show with you, it's, I might get a local review in a community paper. And I know you're going to give me everything you can do, but can you produce me a catalog? Well, you know, that may, it depends on funding. 
you know, if my development director and my director and I can convince some of the local businesses to come together, it's like, George, I, I get, I get it. When I was a young man, I would have hopped at this opportunity, right? Yes, and I'd be so grateful. But I'm at this stage in my life now where I have to make some very careful decisions, and um, I'm, I'm looking at this. So, but as an artist myself, I can say, well. I get that. Um, here's why your work speaks to me, and this is why I'm so committed to it. And I start talking about the work, and almost to a person, they would always say, "Wait a minute, are you an artist too?" And I go, "Yes." They go, "You talk about my work a little differently. It's it's a little different. Um, it's just as valid as the art historian or anybody else, but there's there's something you get." And I, I go, "Well, you know, whatever that may be, I don't know." But um, I, I do appreciate your position. And they said, do you really? I go, yes. I mean, if I show you, if you have your solo show at our, at our museum, it's going to be a feather in our cap. You are a big name. It changes things. Now, having a museum show with us is just, it's kind of a sideway kind of maneuver for you. It's not an upward step. You're waiting for the Smithsonian or the Metropolitan or the Modern Museum of Art to give you a major show, and then you're going to be on the cover of Art News or Art in America. I can't give you that. I, I love that you can approach this from both ends and create this mutual respect with an artist, because what you just explained for our audience is that being an artist is a career. Like, any, like anyone else is building their careers and making strategic decisions on what job to take and where it's going to lead next. And, at the main, and in the meantime, you got to sustain yourself on top of that, right? Because if you're serious about it, it's, 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 like, it's a lot of work. You're running your own business, so to speak. But speaking of art career, what it's, you already have your own. Very, you are an accomplished artist, so you have your own art career, and you are a very, very passionate art educator. And anybody who has not seen that episode yet, go back. We'll link it up in the description. But what made you choose these extra roles, challenging roles, from what it sounds like, in addition to your own art practice and your own art you career? You see, this is one of the things that I love about Art Sparks. Both of you asked the deep, relevant, real-to-life questions. Now, when I was a young artist at San Jose State University working towards my graduate degree, I was still unknown. Everything was possible, but nothing had happened yet. I wasn't teaching yet. I was doing graduate teaching at San Jose State University, but everybody was out there. It was all these talented people waiting for an opportunity to teach. And I had to just stand in line with everybody else. And, it's like, and that line was way out there. Um, and I'm realizing to live in the South Bay area on one's own um, was going to be a challenge financially. And know. Yes, you, you know. We know. We you all know. know. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you have wonderful family money, that's awesome. If you win the lotto, that's awesome. If you divorce really well and you got a ton of money without any bad strings emotionally or psychologically, that helps. But if you're just trying to start out and you know, you're know you getting this, this graduate degree in fine arts and you're wondering, okay, um, so how am I gonna make a living? And how am I gonna juggle all this? It does take an extraordinary amount of energy, commitment, sacrifice as you both realize and so when i was in school you know i i'm doing all the things that i'm doing and i'm looking at these exhibitions within the art department wondering how do you get a show and who puts these shows together who how does it happen and in fact how do you get shows outside who who determines that at, at the local galleries the nonprofits? i started asking questions they go well that's what a curator does Oh, I had no idea that's what it, wow, they get to pick the shows? Oh, I like that, you know? Not just from the power perspective, but you know, to be very honest, I always I always thought, wow, I, I see certain spaces that only show maybe this kind of work. Kind of lean that way. This one kind of leans that way. 
and I would see different, let's say, clicks in the community. And I just thought, why would one just choose one or the other? It's all good if you just look at the work and choose the strongest and the deepest ideas. Um, of course, I was a little naive then. You know, I was romantic idealist. It wasn't until later I understood more about, okay, this one has a mission statement. This is their identity and it's, ne it's necessary. You know, I didn't know that when I was in school, but I just thought, I, I want, you know, can I curate? What's it take? Um, like both of you, I, instead of just watching and, and wondering, I just stuck my hand up. Can I, can I curate a show? Well, submit in your idea first. And, you know, I started putting small shows together in, in the smallest galleries at San Jose State University, the smallest ones upstairs in a corner. People would see it and they'd like it. They'd talk about it. And then I'd get opportunities and professors would say, look, we got a couple of spaces opening up. Would you like to, you know, put something together? It's like, oh yeah, I love this. I never thought about being paid. I just, wow, they want me to do it. You know, I, I'm, I'll do it. Uh, I'm meeting more artists and uh, people are going to know me and they're going to know my art. And then I started curating outside the school. Uh, again, not charging for my services. I wanted to learn the ropes. And while I was still in school, I would have uh, meetings with the San Jose Museum of Art director, who at the time, his name was Albert Dixon. And I also met with Dr. Delmar Cole, who was director of the San Jose Art League. He was the first museum director at the San Jose Museum. So both of these two, and then I also talked with Edna and Farley Young, who were owners of the Young Gallery in downtown San Jose for many decades. I, I went to people with the knowledge and I said, I, I'm a young Jedi Knight. <laughs> I, I'd like to learn, uh, how, how do I do this? How can I not embarrass not just myself, but also the artists that are, are trusting me? And they're, they're just saying, well, what are you charging to do this? I go, nothing, I, I'm learning, I, I need to learn. I need to learn about insurance. I need to learn about how to protect the work, how to show the work, how to publicize the work, how to get the word out to the, to the art critics, how to get it listed. How do I do these things? Every one of them took their time with me and, and they showed me the ropes. And the best thing I did was I listened. I took notes. But I, I never, never was so arrogant that I just thought I knew it all. I knew what I didn't know, which was I didn't know a lot. So I went and I asked people who did know. And uh, I learned from everybody. And so I started putting shows together. Uh, and the thing was, I started that with my colleagues, students, and then local artists. And then I started going after large name artists. And, and they would say, excuse me, who's this? I go, this is George Rivera. Have we ever met? Do I know you? I go, no, but uh, I got your number through this person. They go, oh, oh, okay. Brilliant. Uh, and, and they said, I should call you. And so what, why are you talking to me? I would love to have you work in this theme show. Well, Mr. Rivera, I don't know you. I, I, I go, well, Mr. McLean, you are, I'm a fan of your work. Let's just say you're one of the best in the Bay Area. If you say yes to this, I can get other people of your caliber. It takes one. I'm a young curator. Um, I can't do this, this, I, I'm making nothing off of this. I'm just learning to be a curator. And if you are willing to take a chance on me, I would say 90% of the time they say yes. And I, once I had one, I would get the other one. And I would say, can you think of somebody else I should call? And they go, call my friend and you tell them, this is, you know, I told you to call. And next thing you know, I'm putting together these shows and I'm approaching the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and I'm talking to the Oakland Museum and I'm talking to small museums in Southern California. And every director or curator I met, I know that they saw a little of themselves in a young me a long time ago. And so I truly, I, I have been helped by a legion of people who didn't have to, but they took the time. So um, then that's, I, and I applied for a job, you know, at the San Jose Art League as a very young 
person still in school? And they said, yes. And, and that's how I started to make a living in the art field because, you know, my paintings weren't, weren't selling at that time, uh, not enough to live in, in the area. And, um, and being a curator was for me, um, a little bit more, I appreciated that instead of driving delivery trucks or working at fast food places. Totally. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but as an artist, sorry, as artists that we have followed you in a way that we have, I'm talking experience that I have um, opportunities because of you and we've been being jurors in shows that we've been in. We appreciate all that effort and all that all career that I've been doing. And I love, and also, After the, after the last episode that you talk about your education and teaching, I will hear that. And as an artist, we appreciate very much. But in here, I want you, what would you say a person that is not artistic, that they just go to the museum, what would you tell them so they feel more comfortable with the art world, with the art itself, so they could be enough, comfortable enough to say, okay, I will think you're taking home with me. <laughs> your point I don't know what would you say to them I would say if you can go to a museum and take Heron or Siglindi with you <laughs> take an artist, just, take, take, go, go with a friend who's an artist who feels art passionately with an open mind you know you can go with a certain artist that maybe only likes one thing and and then that will come through when you're in the museum and it's like oh what about this room like, Um, that's, I don't really care for that work, you know, that much. You, know, I, you can read about it. You don't want that projected on you. I, I want to go to a museum where, you know, I'm hearing both of you going, oh, I don't work this way, but this work moves me. This really, I, I feel it and I'm going to watch you. And when I watch your eyes tear up and I see you getting goosebumps, I'm going to say, what is it you see? And then I'm going to look with trust where you might say, Okay, you know, don't worry about reading anything yet. Otherwise, you're going to look at this work and say, okay, you know, uh, this is what Kathy Kowitz was trying to say, you know, back in 1918. This is what happened to her family. Her son, you know, died in a war. And so then you, you start thinking of, okay, this is Kathy Kowitz's story, or this is her, her message. Instead, I, I would rather have somebody like the both of you say, all right, let's just... Let's just start with the scale. There's a purpose. Everything that you are witnessing, the artist has purposely chosen. The size, the color, the color harmonies or disharmonies, everything, the texture, where you might think the color is not fully painted in, that was done on purpose so that you can see through it. There's a little push pull. It, it will draw you in. I'm, I'm asking you to trust me completely and let go of any preconceived notions you may have had and everything that you've done in your life at work. Because most people, if you work five days a week, by Friday, there better be a, a, a result, a product that shows this is a success. But when you're looking at art, it's just the exploration, the process, the journey itself is the magic. And sometimes it comes to fruition and sometimes it doesn't. George, so I think busy, you know, somebody, a Mark Rothko or something like that. And they're like, I don't get it. I, these are the conversations that I have. Go with Siglinda, go with Tara. <laughs> But so what you're, what you're saying is really like, we need to learn to look at art and the best guides to teach us to look at art is not necessarily the curator statement on the wall it is another artist and that's one thing and at the same time i feel the other thing that you're saying is as artists we've the biggest thing that we've done i feel sometimes is like we've given ourselves permission to feel and in the end how you feel the, the emotions that a painting brings up is what matters most but i feel that a lot of times people don't give themselves that permission Case in point, um, a recent open studio, there was a young woman who looked at two small abstract pieces I had on the wall. And she looked at it and she looked at it for a while. So I started talking to her and she said, 
I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding this. I was like, well, it's abstract. So I'm like, okay. Um, how, well, how, how can we, how can we have a conversation? Right. It's like, okay, tell me more. And she said, I knew I liked portraits and I knew I liked landscapes, but I didn't think I liked abstract art, but I like these, <laughs> but I don't understand why. And it was a beautiful conversation. And in the end, I asked her like, okay, so, well, what is it that you like about it? And she tried to see things in it, right? Yes. And so I said, well, what if you don't have to see something in it? You know, it's not a Rortok test or an intelligent test, or, or like you say, you need the results test. Like, what if I just give you permission that you don't have to see anything? What if you could feel? And she took it and she exploded. And then I said, Sometimes people are afraid of abstract art because there's so much freedom in it that they don't know what to do with all this freedom because nobody tells them how to use this freedom. But there are no rules. You know, you just give yourself permission to embrace the freedom and to respond to the work. And if you want to see a horse and a waterfall, that's mm -hmm. fine, but you don't have to. And if you just feel because, you know, you look at an abstract painting, it's like, I don't know what this is about, but when I look at it, I just feel happy. That's totally valid too. You, absolutely. You know, like music. You may not understand the language that the opera is in. And if you're if you're open-minded and, and you're there and you're willing to channel in the experience openly, open doors, it will move you. It's a choice human beings make. Um, I, I remember sometimes in my life when I was in a very, maybe dark episode and my friends are like, come on, we're going to take you to the comedy club and it's going to make you feel much better. But if I went to the comedy club with an attitude of, I don't care who's up there, I'm not in the mood for fun. I'm not going to laugh. You can will yourself to, to, to lean a certain way. But if you just go in, like if you can find that center, which is so hard for most people, and just okay, I'm just going to be here. And I, you know, I, I remember one time I took a friend up uh, to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art to see a body of work. It was a major show um, featuring uh, Bay Area abstract expressionism uh, right before World War II and after. One of my favorite periods of painting. I, I just loved the work. And I brought a colleague that was just skeptical about anything abstract. And as soon as we got out of the elevator, I looked in the gallery, I just, I just said, whoa, 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 just wait. I had to collect myself, because I just said, thank you, curators. You put the right pieces in the right place. Oh, it's powerful. How can you not be moved by that? Okay, I need to set the stage for my guest. Because if you just walk in, you don't know what you're experiencing or why. You don't know what to trust. Um, and, and trust is important. This is why I was alluding to having a friend that you trust. Uh, you, you're willing to like, okay, you know, I won't fight. I won't disagree with you. I'll try to keep an open mind. Uh, I'll, I'll just, just give it a try. And I would say, now the first one you're going to see is, and, and as a curator, here's something I, I always try to share. Is the example of work you're looking at, is it a great example created by the artist or is it just the name on that painting because i i've taken some of my students to see a show and, and there may be a little jackson pollock this big and they'll look at it and they go I, I just is it wrong to say that teacher i go no 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 yeah, that, that piece was actually uh, uh, not even a secondary level it was just uh, something in the studio they, somebody it was jackson pollock so they didn't have a pollock so now they got a pollock but if you could see the lavender poles in person if you could see one of the strong ones in person and it's lit right and i set you up and stand you will feel it and i'm not asking you to buy it i'm just asking you to just try to understand the message of this and you know this was painted in 1947 and they're like, wow, I said, everything that's come since then was based and influenced from that. But this was so powerful and unique, and you know why. This is, and, and, and we talked about art history. You, you know, as when we talk about the church preaching to the choir, you know, the three of us, this is, that's, that's, you know, when we speak amongst 
colleagues. We understand all of this. How do we share this to people from the outside, as you're both saying? How do we make them feel comfortable? Well, even back when it was realism and the majority of people were illiterate, they couldn't read or write. They weren't allowed into the places that had great art. But when they saw some art in the church, they were taught what was in the painting. So when they look, they go, okay, that's why Mary wears blue. That's why this represents fidelity. That's why this represents this. Everything, people would, would share stories. It was storytelling. And so people felt comfortable when they looked at a work, they go, oh, this is from this mythology or this is from a biblical verse. They got it. And in the 20th century, as we went into art that was much more individualistic, much more expressive and came without explanations and we're asking people, we're telling them, this is great art. Where do you see it? They have no point of reference of understanding or connecting to it. Museums, this is, I feel museums have an important role of, of being that guide so that when you go to the fancy gallery in New York City or San Francisco and there's just a painting and there's nothing on the wall, they can at least say, okay, I, I got some background training on this. I, I went to an art appreciation class. I get this. But there has to be that effort. And, and I believe museums uh, play a vital role. And, and it's important that they continue doing this. Yeah, and you know what? You just said something so spot on. I have to hook into that for a moment. When it's realistic, people have a reference point and they can see if, if the artist has a certain skill or not, right? When we veer away from realism, it gets a little bit more convoluted and then people need to give themselves this permission that there is no reference point and they have all this freedom to interpret it in their own way. And quite frankly, regardless of the name, like it or don't like it, right? That's their prerogative. But you also mentioned, you brought in music and this makes like, okay, it begs for the perfect analogy, right? People are very good at saying, I like this music or I don't like this music, likely because of the way it makes them feel. People also say, yeah, I don't care that she just won a Grammy award or an Emmy award or whatever it is these days. Like, I don't, I don't like her, right? Mm -hmm. And no, I like the way she dresses. And, <laughs> right. And nobody says, I don't play guitar. So I don't know if this is a good song or not. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, it's become so common mainstream in music to say, well, I like it or I don't like it based on what, how I feel about it. And it's okay and it's accepted. But okay, visual arts may be a little bit more challenging, but in essence, you, like, even if it's just as a starting point, I feel it's okay to embrace that same freedom. Be open-minded, please. Like, you can also just dismiss a song without even listening at it. And it's like, well, you didn't even listen. So you don't even know if you liked it or not. But if you look at a piece of art without dismissing, having like your colleague, like come in with an open mind, right? And, and take it in. Then, you know, how does it make you feel, right? And regardless of the name, do you like it or don't like it? And, and, and that's, that's fine. Would you, would you agree with that? Or am I like yes. out of league now? No, no. No, no, this is why when we talk about the arts, when, when I teach an art appreciation class at the colleges, I, I, I bring in everything. And nothing makes the kids laugh more than watching their old teacher do some pop dancing when I just, you know? <laughs> and I'm going, and they're going like, that, film him, you know, get it on YouTube. What are you doing? Are, are you okay? And, and I was like, it doesn't matter. Film, animation, the everything that you're watching, that comes from a creative background. This is all the arts, music, dance. Embrace it all. I know that some art forms when you're young, it's more rebellious. It's an attitude. It, it also projects the persona you want. Oh, I was when I was a young man cruising down in my fixed up hot rod car and I'd have music blaring out. I mean, that was part of my persona, my my bad attitude, you know? And I was a nice, sweet guy, but it was part of this role. And I, I think athletes do the same thing. They listen to certain music, it gets them focused, it's charged up, it lifts their spirit, they believe they can do. It, it's the mind and convincing oneself of what's possible. 
whether you use film or you're watching anime and it charges you up or you watch the latest Avengers movie and you want to be just like Iron Man or whatever. Yeah, it, it's this, the arts can, can lift you up. But sometimes I think when people think of museums, art collecting, maybe some galleries, they just feel that's for another part of society that they don't come from or live in. And that they're going to be judged the minute they drive up in a Prius and they come walking in with some sandals and they're not dressed properly and they don't ask the right questions. You know, it's just that sense of judgment and then how, and, and, and we've seen it in the fields, you know, at the different levels, you got the large museum, middle museum, the small museum. Um, and, and you just, when you get together for conferences, you can just, you can feel it and you can see it. You can see these type of click societal levels and and it doesn't have to be right it doesn't have to be and if you're just with the artist and you're just with the musicians i mean if you're sitting there with carlos santana you you just there's another nice human being that is asking you questions about your life and it's like wow you know how phenomenal is that you know dancers artists are just so down to earth it's it's the business that sometimes i think um wants to create this sense of separation and you know a sense of importance and, and it really i think that's a mistake uh because museums everywhere are trying to solve a problem of how do we get the community to come into our museum we're here for them and i hate it when i hear people say we're here to educate them what did you just hear yourself? You think you are better? Well, I, I didn't mean that. I was just, that was just the same. No, no, no. It's, um, you know, one of the first things I did when I became director of Detroit, I went out into the community and I asked leaders, what do you think of our museum? I haven't seen you there. I almost felt like somebody working at the church. I haven't seen you at church this Sunday, George. Where have you been? You know, and I was like, oh God, you know, feel good. But I said, you know, how can, I want our museum to be this community's museum. And they said, well, you know, George, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it from a business perspective. Anytime you need money, you come to us in the community. You come to the businesses, you want some money, you want a grant, you want us to buy tickets, you want us, you know, to do all this. What are you doing back for the community? Besides exhibitions and education programs, which we think are awesome or films, or receptions, family days, that's all wonderful, but are you committed to our community? Lovely. And I just said, you know, you're right. Um, I'm, I'm going, you know, if you'll have me, I'll, I'll join the Rotary, which I did. And I, I'm gonna visit all the other service groups. I'm gonna visit church groups. I'm gonna visit communities. And I'm gonna say, you know, I care about Santa Clara, I'm, I'm here. Uh, what can we do? I'll roll up my sleeves. You need me to help wash cars. What can I do to help? And not ask anything back for it. Just show a commitment to your community. And I learned that from successful people in business. And in fact, one of these leaders said, you know, your board president at that time, he was head of Great America. Um, and he, he, goes, he showed up and he introduced some stuff to the community of how can I and my wife help out um, to make Santa Clara a, a better community for everybody. And I tried to follow some good advice and, and I was lucky, I, mean, I, I tried to listen. I tried to implement what I had learned. So, you know, it, it's, it, that's an important part. I think sometimes when we think of museum directors, we think of the educational background, you know, all that lineage, uh, the sophistication, you know, the connoisseurship, absolutely. And in a, a strong business sense. But if you are located in a community, you have to build bridges into the community and, and not just expect people that are going to come to you for that enlightened education. And on that note, George, I just want to say wanna thank you. you because you, as an artist, as an art educator, as a museum director, as an art juror, as an art curator, you are such a genuine member of this community and we appreciate you so much. 
we as artists and hopefully non-artists as well and everything you shared with us in the previous episode and today is so profound and such such building blocks and such a, an invitation to everybody to build the, pr the bridge between art and, and non-arts but or art lovers you know and art creators or art sellers and art buyers and 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 help us help everyone understand that we are connected and we are together and we all have our mission and our purpose and we all elevate each other each in our own way and no one is too small or doesn't dress appropriately or doesn't drive the right car to to not connect and 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 you know engage in a win-win collaboration because i'm all for win-wins like i don't think i do anything that is not a win-win <laughs> well and art is everywhere that's the other thing is like you know it's everywhere you can hear it anywhere like you can see it you can hear it so and you're invited everybody to join in the party yes exactly exactly no? yeah. yes and i really want to thank you both you are playing a big part of, of being that bridge and you're both standing there come on in the water is fine come on this is for you all of this is for everybody equally that's true, that's true. thank you so much george thank and you very thank, much and thank you everybody for watching please like subscribe it really helps us in the algorithms and share this episode with anybody who would love george's message and would benefit from it Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.